See if you can. Oh. Um, okay, so I can see now. <laughs> Hello. I just know this wasn't about me. So, but anyway, yeah. still alone on the screen there. Hi. <laughs> when they start. Oh. <laughs> um, you know, Riley was used to live in Southampton. We were talking before you got here about um, you know how. Oh yeah, did you, Riley? Yes, I did. All oh, right. When was that? Uh, it was about uh, five years ago, I think it was. All oh, right. And where are you now? North, North Wales. All oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. You know all about this area then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of it, some don't. Yeah. But, um, Benedict said, thank you, Julie, for allowing us to interview you. It's getting late mm -hmm. here, so I might leave soon. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> what time is it there? It's <laughs> 9 o'clock p.m. here. Yeah, we're in a totally different time zone. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm ready when you are, Riley. Okay, okay, so I'll start I'll now. <laughs> okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Today we have our guest, Julie Cook. Would you like to introduce yourself, Julie? Yeah, hello, my name is Julie Cook and I'm a Titanic descendant. Uh, my great-grandfather died on the Titanic and I'm also an author of the book The Titanic and the City of Widows It Left Behind. Okay, um, Jill, would you like to introduce yourself as you're here? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jill, and I run the Titanic Book Club, and Julie is one of our wonderful members, and if you go on to the Titanic Book Club YouTube channel, you can find two interviews. We had one with you first with Gareth Russell, which is really fun. Yeah. And, um, 
We're just so happy that you're here and helping Riley and Benedict with their project. Thank yeah, you. I think it's fantastic. Oh, and Ben, oh, and Benny's gone. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to our first question. Yeah. What inspired you to write your book? Um, just being a family member, really. My great grandfather died on the ship. He was a stoker. Um, and I just grew up hearing his story from my dad. And I was a writer anyway. I'm a journalist. And, you know, I always wanted to write a nonfiction history book. But this seemed the most obvious thing to do because it was a family story. I already knew quite a lot about him and what he'd endured and, you know, the way he had died. So it just seemed a natural progression to write that as my um as my non-fiction book. Okay, uh, we will now play a video made by Benedict. Okay. Uh -huh. Oh, wrong video. Oh, no, it's not. Um. Hello, Miss Julico and others. I am Ben from Mozilla, a culture all my standing enthusiast of filming. This interview is for my documentary film, Dancing Sinkable Voyage. Dancing Sinkable Voyage documentary is about the ship, our construction, the launching. Miss you can you tell us about your daytime life and the story of your family before and after? Okay, so that was the first question from Benedict. Okay, so um, yes, as I said, my great grandfather was a stoker on the Titanic. So I grew up hearing his story a lot. And um, my father was very interested in the Titanic. He was a Titanic enthusiast and collected lots of things and sort of looked into my great grandfather's life and, and sort of got bits and pieces together. So it was already in my mind. Um, and then as I got older and watched my own, found my own way of looking at the Titanic, watching documentaries, watching films, reading books, um, I realised that I wanted to write a book about the Stokers and their wives. Um, initially, I wanted to write just about the Stokers because I felt they hadn't been represented much in Titanic works. Um, I felt it had been more about the rich than the first class. Um, so I looked into them. And then when I looked into them, I found that their wives had suffered terribly um because they relied on their earnings so much so the book then sort of changed direction slightly um and i realized i wanted to write about the women and the wives and the children so that's how the book took shape it started off me wanting to write about my great granddad and then learning how the titanic of tragedy affected all the people around them. it wasn't just the people who went down with the ship it was their wives their children anybody dependent on their earnings so that's how it came to be Okay, um, we will move on to our next question, which is the rest of the video. Okay. First, I need to share the sound. Okay. Miss Julie, do you have any advice for me on how to create a great book and film about the ship or Miss Titanic?
Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, film, I, I'm i not uh, sort of au okay with that, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm not a filmmaker, but I am an author. So I would say um, to write a Titanic book, I think you need to first of all tell yourself there is space for your book. I think because the Titanic has been so told so many times in so many ways, authors, including myself, when you first think about a book, you think, well, is there even space for my book? Is there even a place for my book in this hugely documented topic I think first of all you have to think well no there is there is space for my opinion I think that's important um and then perhaps looking at another way in you know that as I say there are certain parts of the story that I think have been done a lot uh namely sort of the very famous first class passengers have been done a lot I think the first class itself has been done a lot and I think there's been a lot done on the sort of um practical and technical looks at the ship whereas I think there are still certain subjects that haven't been done I'd say look into perhaps um, the stewards. I don't think many anyone's done something major work on just the stewards and the, of the stewardesses. You know, there are 23 stewardesses on the, the boat. That's a nice angle. The female workers on board. Um, I think looking perhaps at the post-traumatic stress that happened afterwards to the men who survived, I think that would be interesting because I think at that time people didn't really look at post-traumatic stress particularly in men so I think that'd be interesting to follow how their lives went on how it affected them perhaps the tragedy afterwards so I think there's always other ways in I think there are always other uh, looks at the Titanic tragedy other than what's been done but the key is trying to find a new way of looking at it a new angle I would say all right um what did you learn from writing your books um I learnt about true poverty, I think. I think even though I knew they were poor, the workers, the very low workers who went on the ship, I had no idea how poor until I did my research. I, I had no idea how, um, how much poverty they were living in, um, how hand-to-mouth they lived, how wonderful it was when the Titanic steamed into Southampton because there'd been a coal strike. I knew there'd been a coal strike, but I didn't know how badly it affected people. Um, so when I did my research, I found school... Uh, logs from the local schools which said that children were going to school with no boots on their feet they had nothing to eat you know the coal strike had really devastated the working class areas who worked on the ships um I didn't realize how badly that had affected them until I did my research so I think it was just learning how very poor these people were and how um they relied on on seafaring industries to survive uh, so when Titanic came into Southampton, it was such a godsend. It was such an amazing thing for them because this was their answer to get out of poverty. And that's what I think made it so sad for me was that it was seen as such an amazing, life-changing, wonderful event for them as the lowly workers. And yet so many of them perished. So I think, yeah, that I learned that definitely from it. Okay, next question. What, what surprised you the most ab about the Titanic? Surprise me. Um, I think some of the, the crazy facts I found about it, like, you know, how many how many chickens and eggs and things are on board or, you know, <laughs> things like that. Some of the, the wilder sort of everyday facts that you, you find out as you go along. Um, just the sheer scale of it for the time, I think, was pretty impressive. Um, what else? I, I think looking at the disparity between the very wealthy and the very poor that really surprised me as well I knew again I knew it was a big disparity I knew the rich were very rich but when you look at it from our standards today it's hard to understand that until you get into it and learn as I say just how very poor the, the poor working classes were and then when you look at the incredibly the, the incredible wealth there was in first class uh they were sort of like the oligarchs of today weren't they they were they were billionaires in the standards of today um so I think just the sheer difference between the very, very rich and the, and the very poor was quite shocking to me. Does your study of the Titanic and or her passengers overlap with any of your other historical interests? If so, what are these other areas of interest? Yeah, it did actually. Um, I realised when I was researching, obviously I knew about women's suffrage. Uh, the suffrage movement was gaining momentum at, at the same time. So to 
read about that sort of running concurrently with the Titanic tragedy was very interesting. Um, women were, you know, trying to get the vote. They were trying to gain suffrage. They were trying to get um, rights, property, you know, all those things were happening at the same time as the Titanic. So it was really interesting when the Titanic went down, there was a lot of discussion about whether women's suffrage was a good or a bad thing. Um, weren't men so chivalrous? Weren't men wonderful letting the women survive? Um, that was really interesting because I'm interested in women's suffrage. So that was a really interesting thing to read. Um, I'm fascinated by the First World War as well, which although hadn't happened by that stage, it was pre-First World War. And I think it was kind of the last era where this kind of world existed um, before the First World War. So that was fascinating to sort of look at a glimpse of this, this world that was about to change just a couple of years later. Um, and, and how many of those men who survived would then go on to fight in the First World War. So, yeah, that, that does overlap with other things I'm interested in. How did you find out that your great-grandfather, I forgot his name, was a relative of yours? William, his name is, yeah. Um, my father would just tell me when I was growing up. So when I was... Um, you know, knee high to whatever I was tidy when I first heard it. I'd always known it. It was just in my head, in my blood, you know, your great grandfather died on Titanic. That's all I ever heard from my father growing up. Uh, so it was very much just, just a story I knew. Um, just like you learn there's a father Christmas, you know, it's it just something I knew. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't a great shock or anything getting older and, and watching the films, the documentaries and the books, because I already knew that we'd had a relative who had died on it. Um, but it's interesting when you meet other people and you tell someone you've lost someone on Titanic, people are really fascinated. And of course, that's all I'd ever known. So I didn't think it was I didn't think it was that big a deal, really, when I was growing up. Could you tell us a bit about your great grandfather? Yeah, uh, he was called William. He was 40 and married. He was a father of five. Uh now, I'm 44 and I've got two children, so I don't know how he was a father of five, but that, they had a lot of children those days. Um, he was very hardworking. Um, as far as I'm aware, he'd been on various other ships of the day. He was always a stoker. And a stoker, as you probably know, was um, also known as a fireman. And they worked in the bowels of the ship, literally shoveling coal into the fires to make the Titanic sail. So... I was interested to learn how hard he worked, how difficult that job was. Um, what else did I learn? I learned that he'd been a farmhand before. He and his uh, wife, when they first met, they were working as agricultural workers, sort of doing harvesting and field work and stuff in the countryside. And I thought it was quite sweet that they had married on Christmas Day because that was the only day farmhands and servants could have a day off. So they married on Christmas Day and then sort of went straight back to work, which I thought was quite touching. Um, and they moved to Southampton for a better life. So they lived in the countryside um, and they moved into Southampton to get a better life, I assume, for themselves and their children, um, which is kind of ironic when you think that he then lost his life doing what he did and she she remained quite poor afterwards. So, yeah. But uh, it must have been a lot of hard work, like putting the coal into the stokers. Yeah, I mean, it... it I can't imagine it. Um, you know, I was reading other works about it. Other people had done it, um, research on it and also sort of newspaper articles at the time, um, just learning what it was like to be a stoker. Um, and it's easy for us, I think, to say, oh, you had to shovel some coal. But I think shoveling some coal for four hours straight, nonstop, in 50 degree centigrade heat, surrounded by other men equally hot and exhausted um must have been absolute hell um i don't know how they did it i don't think i could do it for 20 minutes let alone four hours which is why the stokers had to be um although they were very poor they were they had to be very physically not necessarily strong but they had to have stamina to do what they did so when you imagine them you'd imagine these sort of burly guys but they weren't they're were very wiry very lean very thin very malnourished but they had this incredible stamina to do what they did um, so yeah, it must have been unthinkable, and to think that that was the job you you had to choose to do or starve, um, you know, because so many of the stokers before they went, they were fighting that even a day's work at the docks, they'd actually fight on the gates of the docks to try and get half a day's work to be able to feed their children. So um, I, I realised how desperate they must have been to take that job. Can you tell me and the viewers watching about your book? 
Yeah, um, it's called The Titanic and the City of Widows Left Behind. Um, as I say, it started as a look at the Stokers and their life, but evolved into um, a, a look at what the women went through as well. So the women left behind, that's what the book title is, um, because I was sort of interested in how the Titanic tragedy continued to affect people. So it didn't just go down and hit the iceberg and that was it. I wanted to look at how it affected um, their families, their wives, their children, the community in Southampton um, afterwards. So it looks at that. It looks at what it sets the scene, first of all, of what these people were living in. They'd been a coal strike. They were very poor. There was diphtheria. It was a horrible time to be poor. Uh, most people lost at least one child to diphtheria. Um, my great grandfather had lost a child as well. So, um, Child mortality was very high. It was very um, awful life, very difficult life. So I set the scene and then go into this amazing ship sailing in and giving them a chance of, of to earn some money. And then, of course, the tragedy when it, it sinks. And then the, the book then looks at how the women carry on and, and what they did to survive in the years afterwards. Okay. Uh, I ain't got any other questions written down. Okay. So that will be it, I'm guessing. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. That's okay. It's a pleasure. Wish you all the best with it. Yeah, thank you so much for supporting them and, and their project. I just love their enthusiasm. Interesting. Yeah. I always love hearing your story. And, um, it's a great it's a great yeah fun. thank you uh, yeah I think, really I think it's fantastic that they're you know Riley and Benedict you're so young I know you probably don't think you're young but you are young <laughs> I think you is have this passion to do this I think is it's just really admirable it's brilliant I'm currently working on a book as well yeah yeah so it's brilliant yeah keep writing that's that's the key you've got to get it written down yeah, do you know what your angle is going to be, Riley? Like everyone has an angle, like Julie's angle is something very new. You know, we really got to know what it was like for the, the families left behind, you know, because that's a part of the story we don't hear about. Everyone's always talking about the first class and how beautiful the ship was. But, you know, once people get, get off in New York, it seems like the story ends. And, and Julie, you know, brought that story to life, you know, what it was like for them. Do you know what... He, you want to focus on Riley already? Um, at the moment, I've decided to focus on about um, why she, about why she was built and what she looked like, and then I'll be moving on to her being built, and then the maiden voyage, the sinking, and then the mm -hmm. Carpathia, and then that's sort of the whole story. And then yeah. I'll probably introduce some passengers about how their life was like before and after the disaster. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by what life was like after for them, I think. I think that would be really interesting and to see how it affected them for years to come. And we know how it affected the big names or some of the, um, the more famous names, but I think it'd be interesting to see what the post-traumatic stress must have been like for for anyone on board really it must have been immense you know i found a titanic um survivor's relative had lived in my town in rochester new york and my friend jason and i went and we were taking pictures of the house and it was the house that belonged to lillian bentham and while we were out there this woman came out and she's like what are you guys doing and we said Oh, you know, we study Titanic history and passengers, and and we we learned that this house belonged to a Titanic survivor. Well, this woman was so nice; she ended up being her great niece. She brought yeah. us inside, and um, she had boxes of photos, and she had these letters that Lillian was just a teenager when she was on the ship. You know, I should probably try to get her story anyway she said um you know she let me read through these letters and she was this vibrant young teenager going on titanic and her letters were just filled with excitement and and you know talking about boys on the ship you know like even like crew members and 
Um, and then her letters after the sinking were so sullen, like she was just a completely changed person. And I think she sort of lived um, from what I heard from her great niece that as a kind of like a hermit, you know, she just, her, she was the whole, and she had lost her uncle too in the sinking, or was it her grandfather? I can't remember the details, but um, it just really touched me that, you know, this tragedy just completely changed her life, you know? She yeah. Just, yeah, uh, even so young, it's really sad, isn't it, to think how her life must have changed, even, and she's just one person, so it's, I think those lessons must be fascinating, you have to get them out, Jill, have a look. Oh, there's probably so many stories that we just haven't yeah. even heard yet, you know, yeah. like her, like I never would have known that if we weren't yeah. stalking her property. Hanging, hanging around the yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs> but she was oh. so generous and, and, and just the letters just um yeah, I thought maybe she could even publish all that because I think yeah. really, really interesting. There you but go, think, Riley. There's an angle. Yeah, we'll have to find Sherry Bentham for you. <laughs> and actually yeah. someone fundraised and um because she didn't really have a proper headstone and, and the town fundraised and people fundraised and had a headstone put up for her in the cemetery. Those are other beautiful things that people do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, yeah. You don't think about it. You just, because that people say to me, why do you study this tragedy? It's so sad. And I say, I don't know. I guess I'm looking for inspiration because I believe that we all go through hard times. So I'm so curious, like, how did they make it through? Who helped them? And yeah. um, because you, you really, this is a, you know, it's a story of human nature. And then it's like, what other, you know, wonderful human beings stepped in to help others, you know, that were suffering. Yeah, it's, it is. And I think that's why it's so fascinating still, isn't it? I think, as you say, it's, it's, it's universal. It's a story that everyone can be interested in from whatever angle you're looking at. And it's ultimately about the question you ask yourself is how would I act on that night, isn't it? That's, that's the question everyone asks. <laughs> Anything. Yeah, oh, we, all think we're, we think we're going to be brave and we think yeah. this is that and we don't really know how we're going to be. No, no, no. I think and, and now we look at it from today's standards of how we sort of view equality and women's rights and all of that. And I think it makes it even more a talking point, doesn't it, of how you behave. Um, based on all sorts of issues you know gender age wealth status all these things it's I think that's why it's so fascinating yeah it really is it's, it's such, and, and because it sank so slowly there's just so many stories and yeah people that came back were able to share and yeah yeah it was, it was the slowness of the sinking wasn't it I think that me that means we have all these stories and um you know, look at Lusitania, how quickly that went down. It's it's a massive tragedy, but we don't have the, that kind of narrative to look at between what happened and then the sinking, whereas with Titanic we do. And, and as, yeah, that, that gives you a wealth of stuff to talk about. No, oh, and I love how the kids like Riley want to just study every little part of it. Yeah, um, yeah, it's brilliant. Riley, when did you first get interested in Titanic? Yeah. I got interested in Titanic about, I think it was last year, when my mum showed me the film by James Cameron. Oh, right, yeah. And, then, and that sparked your interest. Yeah, and then since then, I've been studying Titanic and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you study it at school? I don't remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you know that you were living in a city that was, you know, had so many Titanic connections? No, I didn't. I didn't know till I was about nine, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and um, Riley just recently went to visit. Um, where did you just go? I'm totally blanking out. The Liverpool? City, the Sea City Museum in Southampton. Oh, right. Oh, I went there. Yeah, it's good there. It's really good. Yeah, it's a really good museum. They've got some great stuff. I went there first when I was first thinking of the book because one thing that made me think was I looked on the wall where all the, 
the crew names are and their pictures. And my great grandfather was just an empty silhouette with just his name and a silhouette because there was no picture of him. And that made me really sad as well because I thought, you know, a lot of these people are nameless, they're faceless because they were so poor they didn't even have a photograph, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that makes you think a lot, doesn't it, that they don't even have an image of them. On some of the Titanic graves, some of them don't, you don't even have names on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's um, it's only now people are really bothering to look into that, making sure people have a headstone or people know where people are. Um, I think in Southampton they're starting to put more placards up on people's houses where people lived, so you can know just how many houses, how many streets were destroyed by this tragedy. You know, it really shows that when you look on a map uh, to see how many streets lost somebody, uh, you realise what a massive tragedy it must have been back then for a whole city even imagine mm, mm. you know a city of widows as you put it so you just think of Indeed. the city of mourning people and yeah and, yeah you know how many resources you know resources can be available for people when you know there's like one or two tragedies but that was just a huge amount of, of families all suffering yeah. at the same time mm, yeah yeah mm. wow so, Riley, have you got any other questions? No, I don't. Okay. I do think you'll ever... Oh, did, um, I was going to ask, image. Now, wasn't someone in the Titanic community able to create an image of your great-grandfather based on something? Or am I... Imagine. No, that is true. Yeah, yeah. There was there's one image of my great grandfather which was in a locket uh, that my aunt owns. So that's the only one that exists. And somebody very kindly, first of all, this was you know were able to digitally scrub it up and make it look nicer. And then somebody else turned it into um, a moving image, really, almost like a, a small video oh, of him, why? just sort of moving his eyes. And oh, it's really really spooky i mean to look at that gives you shivers it just you brought him to life you know um and i think several of them have been done where they sort of move a bit and uh yeah it's it's really weird to see them move and brought to life it's fantastic can't remember who did it now i need no, to check would that be um through the titanic um lighthouse I'm yes yes like yes it yes, yes that's it. it yeah and it was through the titanic that, lighthouse. yeah i'm gonna take i'm gonna put this i found it and um, yes that was it like, and they did it for several didn't they they did it for several of them um different people who'd been on board um and brought them to life just moving very very t little bit but it was so subtle but it was it was like seeing them brought back to life it was amazing yeah i'm trying to see if i can find it so i can um yeah chat for riley oh yeah here it is all right titanic stoker brought it to life yeah the chat here because i don't think riley's seen it yeah because you know it's amazing that people can bring people to life riley i'm sticking it in the chat because i can't screen share it but yeah it's so fascinating um to look at that it's like whoa he's yeah he was so so is everyone in your family kind of like dark like that because he looked very like you know no, that's the weird thing. No, but nobody was. Oh, <laughs> I don't really okay. understand it. Yeah, he looks like this sort of um, really swarthy, Italian y dark looking chap. Yeah. But, um, no, everyone else is quite fair in my family. So I don't I don't know. That certainly hasn't been handed down, not to me. <laughs> I know, it's funny. Yeah. Like in our family, yeah. you know, every now and then there'll be like a redhead, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was kind of the last one. I think after that, everyone just went very sort of brown or blonde or you know nobody's that dark so yeah unless it's just the photograph i don't know but he does look very dark dark eyes big dark mustache uh yeah yeah it's so neat it's so neat that you can bring someone back to like, like the, yeah. the technology is so oh, it's amazing yeah 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 yeah, you'd love to meet them wouldn't you and talk to them and you know just have a chat with them it would be so fascinating just to to hear what they went through, what it was like, what it was like working on the ship. Um, and just, you know, sometimes, you know, when I was writing it, if I was having a bad day or I was, you know, annoyed about something, I think, oh, you know, pull yourself together. You know, you're not a stoker on the Titanic. You're not, 
you know, you don't know what hard life is. Right, exactly. Because um, I don't, someone put on the book club a, a survey, you know, if you were, a, you know, working down there as the black gang, you know, what job would you want? And I said, gosh, I don't think I could do any of those yeah. jobs. That's what's yeah. on the book the weekling. And plus, I guess, you know, it's really hot. And they worked in these short shifts, too, because mm. it's just so hot. They need to get and, you know, get out. and Yeah. And they yeah. just kept working, even, you know, just keeping everything going, which really mm -hmm. makes them yeah. heroes, I think. Yes. Heroes yeah. we don't talk about very often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be neat to see what Riley and Benedict do with their lives because they're just so passionate and enthusiastic. I love it. Yeah. Do you want to go into this kind of thing then, Riley, sort of documentary making or writing? Yes, I do, as well as being an o a oceanographer. Ah, right. Oh, well, even better. <laughs> then you really will, you know, be able to perhaps go and see it. You never know. Yeah, if it's still there. If it's still there, yeah. You've got a few years, I think, <laughs> just about. Yeah, I think, yeah, everyone says it'll be there for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, if you've got nothing else, Riley, then I'll get back to my children <laughs> who I've banished upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> are they back in school now julie yeah are they're they back going? at school they're back at school yeah but um yeah today they're home and it's raining so much so they're stuck indoors and i'm sort of i've told them to be quiet for 40 minutes while i <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank, you so much. thank you so yeah. much for supporting these guys that's okay i wish you all the best with it um uh, riley and benedict and thanks for having me thank you and thank you for, all right for coming Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. All the best. Bye. Bye, John. Bye. 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 Bye.